Well, good morning, church family. How are we? We doing good? You awake? Did you stay up too late watching the football game last night? All right, I do have to tell you, there are a handful of Aggies that I met in the plaza that told me that they went to bed at halftime. They were so disappointed. I'm talking 2%er all the way. All right. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5, as we continue our walk through our fall sermon series, walking through the book of 1 Timothy. If you do not have a Bible, there is a Bible in the pew rack in front of you. Please take that. Keep it as a gift from us to you so that you can have a copy of God's Word. We place those there specifically so that you can have those. When I was going through seminary, so if you don't know, I used to work as a civil engineer, and then the Lord called, uh, called Lane and I into ministry, and so we moved over to Fort Worth, but I worked part-time as an engineer going through seminary. It was a great three years, and, and the Lord blessed. Uh, there were a number of uh, awesome things that uh, actually occurred uh, in that engineering office. I had favor with the boss. And he actually gave me permission to start a Bible study before work, and then I rounded up all of the lost co-workers and got them to go to this Bible study, actually led a number of them to the Lord. Praise God for that. Now, one of those co-workers, his name was Mark. He came to the Bible study. Uh, He never became a believer, to my knowledge, Uh, but we had lots of positive interaction. Now, on a funny note, uh, one time I, I lost a fantasy football bet to Mark, and my punishment was uh, from the moment I left the office uh, to go to lunch until we came back, I had to hold up the hook 'em horn sign <laughs> the entire time. So on the ride outside the window while I order, uh, as you sit through lunch, you know, your hand can get pretty tired after that, all the way, okay? And wouldn't you know it, afterwards, I now have a condition where my hand is actually unable to hold up the hook'em horn sign. Can't do it. When I do, it always falls down like that. I don't know why. <laughs> All right, so, so one day Mark came into the office, and uh, he comes up to me, and he, he shockingly asks me, do you give 10% of all that you earn to the church? I was like, yeah, no way. Where does all that money go? I said, well, to pay pastors and lights and we love to minister to the poor. Our church was involved in an organization there in the Dallas area called Mission Arlington and it was right down the street from the civil engineering office. So we talked a little bit about that and it happened to be at the at the that time uh, that a hurricane had not that long gone through and our church had set aside and sent thousands of dollars to aid in that. And as he heard about this, he's blown away. 10% of all that you make, you give away? Yeah. You see, I don't know if Mark ever became a believer, but this was a very unique moment in his life where he was able to see that Christians were continually and quietly doing the work that today would get much fanfare on social media. That Christians, that I as a Christian represented someone who just consistently gave and loved the fact that my dollars were going to areas of need. Did you know that Christian philanthropy accounts for 70% of all American philanthropy, totaling $300 billion every year? Now, I share that story and that statistic because in our text today, we're going to see that Paul is giving Timothy instruction and the church in Ephesus instruction for caring for widows and how the church is supposed to be organized, and to make sure that those who are really in need, those are the ones who are being cared for. So with that, 
Listen as we read 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 16. 3 through 16. It's a longer section today. Honor widows who are widows indeed. But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now, she who is a widow indeed and who has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. But she who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. Prescribe these things as well, so that, so that they may be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, (coughs) having a reputation for good works. And if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the uh, the saints' feet, if she has uh, assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work, But refuse to put younger widows on the list. For when they feel sensual desires uh, in disregard of Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation because they have set aside their previous pledge. At the same time, (laughs) they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house, not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, talking about things not proper to mention. Therefore, I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach, for some have already turned aside to follow Satan. If any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them, and the church must not be burdened, so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that we gather in Jesus' name, that you inhabit the praises of your people. And Father, that you meet with us and you instruct us on, as a church, how we are to to go about the business of of following you and uh, walking with you. And Father, that your passions are our passions. Father, I I pray to that end this morning, that as we read this passage, as we understand your instructions, that we would be energized and charged. Father, it's going to take the work of your spirit to sustain us in perseverance, but that we would be about your business. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so if you will permit me, and you don't have any way of stopping me, but (laughs) if you'll allow me to, at the beginning, build a biblical theology of care. That will actually provide some much-needed context for our passage. Otherwise, if I'm honest, our passage is, uh, it's rather situational instruction to the Ephesian church 2,000 years ago. And you would find the application pretty limited, okay? So, a biblical theology of care will help us. Now, uh, I highly recommend to you, Tim Keller has a book called Generous Justice. It gives a very thorough explanation of what I'm about to give a summary of. So, in the ancient world, it's an uh, agrarian society. And in that society, specific groups were especially vulnerable. They had no social power. They lived from day to day. Therefore, when difficulties hit, like famines, they were only days away from starvation. Widows, orphans, immigrants, 
and the poor. Now, this is sometimes known as the quartet of the vulnerable in the Old Testament. Listen to Zechariah 7, 9 through 10. Thus says the Lord of hosts, dispense true justice and practice kindness and compassion each to his brother. And do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor. The widow, the orphan, the stranger, that that word there, we would translate that the immigrant, okay? But even, even more potent in our day and time, the refugee. He who has been displaced because there is no home for him or her. And the poor. Those who are the most vulnerable in society of being overwhelmed by the circumstances of life. They are most vulnerable to injustice because they are without money or social status in order to defend themselves, right? They cannot hire lawyers. They are the most vulnerable to being victims of robbery or taken advantage of. Now, what's fascinating is how different Yahweh The God of the Bible is different from all the other gods, the little g gods. See, in ancient cultures, the gods were always associated with the elite of society. The kings, the priests, the military commanders. Not the outcasts, but the God of the Bible gives specific, special concern for the vulnerable. Listen to Psalm 146. In verse 1, you don't have it, so you have 146, 7 through 9 on the screen, but just so you understand the subject, verse 1 says, praise the Lord, praise Yahweh, O my soul. Okay? Praise him for what he does. Verse 7, Yahweh is one who executes justice for the oppressed. Who gives food to the hungry? The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects the stranger. He supports the fatherless and the widow, but he thwarts the way of the wicked. You see, God himself is particularly mindful of the lowly, of those who are most vulnerable. Because God is by nature compassionate and gracious, understanding and sympathetic to weakness. In Luke chapter 4, when Jesus is launching his ministry in his hometown of Nazareth. He is sitting in the synagogue one day, and he stands up, prompted by the Spirit, and he stands up to read a scripture passage, and he asks for a specific scroll. Now, he's going to end what he reads with, this has been fulfilled today in your hearing. Now, think with me for a second, what on earth with the Messiah who is now announcing he is here and that this has been fulfilled, what sort of passage would he stand up and read? He tells them to give the scroll of Isaiah and he turns to 61 and listen to what he says. The spirit of the Lord is on me. Now, that's good, right? We're talking about, oh, this is, this is prophecy. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Look at that. 
You see, our God is a God who enters in to the mess of life. He does not stand aloof or far away. He draws near. And he is especially mindful of those who are most vulnerable of being overwhelmed by life's circumstances. He identifies and specifically calls those who are weary and heavy laden to himself because those are the ones that he has specifically come to save. So now let's take the next step because God next charges his people to care about what he cares about. Because we are a representation of his character. So this is why Israel is charged. Look at Jeremiah 22, verse 3 on the screen. Thus says the Lord, do justice and righteousness and deliver the one who has been robbed from the power of his oppressor. Also, do not mistreat nor do violence to the stranger. Again, that's the foreigner. That is the immigrant, the refugee, the orphan, or the widow. And do not shed innocent blood in this place. So God charges his people to be mindful of what he cares about. But what we find is that all through the Old Testament, Israel repeatedly was found lacking, okay? And this is how God speaks to them about it. It wasn't that Israel didn't keep all the festivals. This is what I want you to see. In Isaiah chapter one, God is speaking to Israel. So on the screen, look at verses 13 and 14. Bring your worthless offerings no longer. Your incense is an abomination to me. I hate your new moon festivals and your appointed feasts. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. You understand, it wasn't that Israel wasn't worshiping. It wasn't that they weren't gathering on the Sabbath. It wasn't that they weren't going through all the religious motions. They were doing all of that. Listen to what God wants them to do instead. Verses 16 and 17. Wash yourselves Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil from your deeds, from my sight. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless. Defend the orphan. And plead for the widow. See, God commands his people to stop playing church, just doing religious activity. He says, that is a burden to me. What I want you to do is to do what my heart desires. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. All right, so we've heard God's heartbeat, Jesus' heartbeat, and then how he commands his people. But Israel continually fell short. But now let's ask the question, if you fast forward, what happens to the New Testament church. Well, in Acts chapter 4, remember Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, the Spirit of God falls? In Acts chapter 4, what you see, what you begin to see is that the people of God freely give. Freely give. And, And they sell the property, they freely give, and they lay the money at the apostles' feet. And then they distribute as any has need. It's this incredible picture. Now, the Bible does not hide that there are problems associated with this, because in Acts chapter 5, immediately after this, uh, you have some people lying about how much they give. They want to seem more pious than they actually are. And then in Acts chapter 6, we see that problems arose over the daily distribution of food. We've talked about this, because a certain sect of people was being ignored, But pause and take in the scene, because for the first time, God's heartbeat is being lived out. 
The church is doing what God had commanded Israel all along but had so rarely done. The church is caring for the most vulnerable. In fact, there's an incredible passage when Paul, this is in Galatians 2.10, but Paul is referencing back to the Jerusalem council. When Paul and Barnabas had come to Jerusalem, they had a very important theological decision to, uh, to solve. And they worked through and they solved it. It was a question of whether Gentiles had to, had to keep the law of Moses. So they worked through that. They decided, yeah, you don't have to keep the law of Moses. But when Paul is recounting that entire encounter, Paul it, it becomes aware to all the apostles in Jerusalem that Paul is now called as the apostle to the Gentiles and, and Peter to the Jews. But Paul and Barnabas are they have the gospel square, and they're, they're, it's like the, the 12 apostles are sending out Paul and Barnabas to the Gentiles to plant churches with the gospel. But they pause real quick at the end, and they say, but Paul, only remember the poor. And Paul says, of which I was certain I was going to do. Only they just solved this huge theological problem. Paul, you're the gospel, uh, you're the preacher, the apostle to the Gentiles. Go with the gospel. Only remember the poor. And so the church, this ministry, becomes commonplace, built into the fabric of the New Testament church. Okay, so now let's, in our mind's eye, let's jump back to our passage, 1 Timothy chapter 5. What is Paul talking about in verse 9 when he says, a widow is to be put on the list? Well, he's talking about this care list, meeting the needs of the most vulnerable with food and with clothing, people that would, would otherwise go hungry or improperly clothed. See, the church is reflecting God's character in giving special attention and resources to the most vulnerable. Now, before we jump into the specifics of our text, we as a church, First Baptist Bernie, must ask ourselves this question. Are we doing a good job reflecting God's heartbeat for the most vulnerable among us? Now, let me answer that question or kind of rephrase it a little bit by say, stating this. If I could tell you, one of the, I am so excited about what God is doing in our church, what I see God doing in our church. How do you know God is moving amongst us? Well, it's when we care deeply about what God cares about. It's when we move in action towards the most vulnerable. So three things let me point out. Now, in our culture, widows are not on the verge of starvation the way that they were in the ancient world. But that does not mean that they're not in a unique spot where they need care. We have uh, somewhere close to 90 widows and widowers in our church. And our deacons do an incredible job of of maintaining contact with them. Just yesterday, we had our, what we call our Acts 6 banquet. And most of you aren't aware of it if you weren't a part of that. But it's an entire lunch that's, that's dedicated to just having an incredible time of fellowship and we, uh, we bring in outside music and, and it's an awesome connection point that we do just to maintain consistent, healthy relationships with our widows and widowers. The second ministry that I want to highlight for us this morning is what we call our side-by-side -side special needs ministry. Okay, did you know that only 11% of churches in the United States have a special needs ministry? It's, it's that rare and difficult to do and to find. 
But over the course of the last several years, we have, as a church, we've invested financially in renovating a specific space for our side-by-sides. We now offer two services. So during both hours, we offer uh, a growth group, Sunday school class that's available during that time. Um, and we have, uh, our, we're three years on our annual uh, special needs prom that we call our Starlight Ball. So on Sunday mornings, we have 15 kids that are enrolled. Then that allows 40 family members to attend church every week, okay? We offer it, like I said, in both services. We've been averaging between five to seven per service every Sunday. Our Starlight Ball, uh, we had 75 uh, special guests attend this past year. Uh, And as a ministry, we also offer uh, parents' night out as a way to give parents a break and have a date night. Uh, We offer those usually about once a quarter. Um, And the last one, we had close to to 40 guests there at that, okay? Now, if, if you would like to serve in these areas, I would point your attention to that, our side by sides. There, there's a serve card in the pew rack in front of you. Uh, I'm going to highlight one other ministry, but if you want to pull that out, you can write your name, your information, check a box and drop that. We would love to show you how you can get plugged in. But the third area of ministry that I want to highlight this morning uh, is our foster care ministry. Since August of 2022, our foster care group here at First Baptist Bernie, um, that support group that meets weekly on Wednesday nights at 6.30, has supported 27 families, and that totals 72 children that have been cared for in their homes during that time, okay? I want, I want you to hear that again, 27 families and 72 children that are accounted for. Now, if you can do quick math, you realize that that's a lot more children than it is families. Those families are currently at capacity. They are stretched to the max. This care and support group is vital. It is fundamental for uh, as they go through what is a very difficult ministry that the Lord has given them, that they have a support group together. Now, while we should uh, be amazed at what has occurred over the last several years, uh, two, three years in this area, you also need to know, church family, you need to know that there is a crisis that is currently going on in Kendall County in foster care. That is in our county, Okay? There is a crisis because there are not enough homes to support the number of children that are in foster care. So much so that as a county, we are sending off or shipping off children, especially under five, to other counties. They are going to Houston and to Dallas. They are going further away from their uh, natural home because in our county, there are not enough homes. So, a couple things I want to charge us with. There's a lunch on the screen here that we're offering in two weeks. Free lunch. We will always feed you because we care about your attention. And especially right after church, I know when your tummy's grumbling, you just can't focus. All right, so we will feed you for free at this lunch. You can take out your phone right now and you can take a snapshot of this. You can snap that QR code. This lunch is an informational lunch to talk about two things. One, to talk about the crisis that is happening here in our county, okay? And is there anything that we can do or you can do about that. But secondly, I don't want you to hear everything I've said and you say, well, listen, I'm too old to take on foster kids. Uh, They're not coming into my home. Uh, That's not going to work. Not everyone is called to be a home for foster care. But listen, as a church, because we see and we hear God's heartbeat for us, 
there is much that we can do to support those who are called into this space. You hear what I'm saying? There is much that we can do to support those that are doing this very difficult work. So there's two action steps. You can come to this lunch. The, uh, the other thing, I talked to Rachel Russo about this earlier this week. She said, you know what would be absolutely amazing? If on Wednesday night at 6.30, okay, they meet over in the FLB upstairs, on Wednesday night at 6.30, what if a number of our church members just walked up there, walked in and said, hey, I know I'm not a part of y'all's, y'all's group. Is there anything I can do to help support you? What can we do to help support you? Okay, that's the charge I'm gonna give us. Now, let's quickly walk through this text. Okay, in our text, Paul is going to give orderly parameters for widow care. Instructions for how a church in Ephesus 2,000 years ago uh, was supposed to care for their widows. But the principles apply to us, both as a church and in our personal lives. Now, the first question that we have to ask is very important, and that is, why does Paul have to lay out orderly parameters for care ministry? Well, simply put, because there's limited funds, right? Because we live in the real world, and there's only so much money. And as we will see as we go through that, some people will take advantage of a situation. So first, Paul says, do not put a widow on the list. If they have family, who should take care of them? Verses four and eight. But if the widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Verse 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the face and is worth than an unbeliever. So there are a number of principles for us here. Right? The church should not be burdened when families should care for each other. And children must see care for their parents as a privilege to return the care that their parents gave them when they were dependent. Children, this is one of our greatest responsibilities, is to care for your parents as they approach an age where they need help. Now, how you do that varies. I'm not laying down legalistic rules, but I do say the, the Bible says honor and sacrifice for them, and this is pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Now, a real quick aside, this does not mean that the Bible requires for you to uh, let your deadbeat family member take advantage of you or live off of you. That would be enabling, okay? We will see in a moment, there's a command to work. This is a principle. Families should care for their own. Secondly, because funds are limited, here the Bible tells us, to give first priority to those who are godly, of good reputation. In other words, care for the faithful first. Now, he goes on to say and rules out those who are sexually promiscuous. Let me remind you that this is, this is not outsider care. Care for those outside the church. This is for within the church. Those who represent the name of Christ where modeling his character matters. Next, take a look at verse nine. It says, don't put a widow on the list who's under the age of 60. Then he goes on to talk about sexual temptation and being idle, gossip, and busybodies. Now, what's going on here? Paul wants the younger widows to remarry and to work while they're capable. Now, first of all, this is because work is good. It brings purpose. It's good for you to carry your own weight to contribute to the team. What must not happen is if one is capable of work but instead chooses to be supported by the church by a handout program. Absolutely not, Scripture says. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, he who does not work does not eat. 
Paul warns of taking advantage. Uh, <clears throat> Paul warns of those taking advantage because they will become idle, gossips, and busybodies. A busybody is one who meddles in other people's affairs and just wants to go around and gossip about it. You see, if man does not find purpose in work, what I would say kingdom work, Satan will help him find trivial purpose in excessive entertainment and gossip, meddling in other people's affairs. So as you comb through this text, you realize there's, there's situational ethics for what the church was supposed to do. And yes, it was 2,000 years ago, and we've learned a little bit about that context, to do this and don't do this. But it's very important uh, for us to think about the movement of the whole letter and why Paul is instructing this, how this fits in. Remember, the thesis for the entire letter is that truth is held up by the church. And that culture that plays so loosely with, with truth and cannot figure out Right, our culture tries to say truth is within me. But when culture gets to the point where it really wants to examine truth, it must be able to look at the church. Where can I find truth? Well, the church is holding up the truth, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so as culture begins to come and look and say, oh, who is this Jesus? As culture begins to examine the people of God, should it find God's house a complete mess, complete disarray, just unorganized, not knowing what it's doing? Well, no, of course not. That's, a, that's where Paul's been, the second half of the letter, right? If we're going to hold up truth, we have to be godly, okay? Practice godly discipline. So now help me think about how the care piece fits in to this godly discipline, that if culture comes and examines, okay, if our culture says, you know what, I, I'm tired of, of, of the world saying that truth is in me, that's hollow, I'm going to go to the church, I'm going to go and hear the good news of Jesus Christ, and then they come, what should they see? Well, this care piece, the culture should see that First Baptist Bernie has the same heartbeat as God. That we care for the most vulnerable, because God does. We know, we know the, the, the gods of the world don't care about the most vulnerable, but the one true God, he does. He cares about the most vulnerable, how they give their time, resources, energy, and effort, a spe specific focus on the most vulnerable. I don't know if, if you guys have noticed, if, if you're observant, but uh, in our foyer right here, we've just redone what we call our FBC missions wall. And on that wall, we have uh, our domestic and international uh, partners that we have. And I just want to call your attention real briefly to, on our domestic side, when you ask the question, as a church, what ministry should we be involved in? And I want you to know, uh, we have like uh, 21 local mission partners, okay? And when, when you ask that question, what are we involved in? You would be proud, okay? We're involved in caring for the poor, the homeless, those who are coming out of addiction, uh, those youth who've been permanently displaced from, uh, from their families in a home, and on and on and on. Those who are in dire situations like the Pregnancy Care Center and need specific attention at that moment, so many of those areas that you as a church member have opportunity to serve, to get your hands dirty and be the hands and feet of Christ, to get plugged in, to live out this missional calling, to have the same heartbeat, to care about what God cares about, and to be active in that. So I want to close with, uh, there was a recent movie, um, came out just 
uh, months ago called The Sound of Hope, The Story of Possum Trot. It was actually, it, it's a, based off a true story of a small town called Possum Trot. Now, that's a heck of a name. Some of you might know where it is. It's a small town in East Texas where a small church, but a pastor and his wife, they're pictured there on the left. That's them in real life. Pastor and his wife began to feel burdened about the foster care system in their county. And the Lord called them to uh, foster and then adopt two. But because that became a catalyst, that it began to be a focus for that church, and they began to pray about it. And before it was all said and done, 22 families went to the county and said, give us your hardest to place children. And they took in 77 of the hardest to place children. Now, that was nearly three decades ago. Here's what I tell you. I'm not going to sugarcoat it at all. Many of those are still dealing with trauma. They weren't all success stories. But the majority of them have now become thriving adults, shattering all the normal statistics about those who are raised in foster care. All because a church took God's word and said, you know what? God has a huge heartbeat for that. We're going to do something about it. Incredible. Incredible. Wouldn't it be amazing if God and his spirit stirred up something specific and unique here that the outside world would look at and go, you know what? At least they practice what they preach. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we hear your word. We hear your heartbeat for the most vulnerable. Show us our part, each of us as individuals and as a church. God, I am so excited at, at our special needs ministry, at our foster care and so many other areas, God, that you are moving. I see it and I rejoice greatly that you are stirring up new works and, and that these areas are growing massively. And God, we know that that is you. God, it's gonna take you to sustain and to allow us to persevere in these areas, but this is your heartbeat. God, we want to walk obediently because you have saved us. You found us when we were your enemies, when we were dead in our sin, when we were not pursuing you at all. We were the beggars on the highways and byways that heard the good news. Allow us to walk in your grace and in your freedom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.